known as the Enfant Terrible of British Letters. His good looks once earned him the title of the Mike Jagger of Literature. Martin Amis is now on his 13th book. The author of The Rachel Papers, Money and London Fields, among others, is considered one of the best British novelists alive. Earlier this month, he attracted a large crowd at the international novel sittings in Lyon. He was there to promote his latest book, Lionel Asbo, but also to talk about his soon-to-be-published novel, set during the Holocaust. I'm very happy to be here with Martin Amis, British writer. You are about to publish a new book, perhaps in the new year, about a love story set in a Nazi concentration camp. You've written about the Holocaust before in Times Harrow. Why is the Holocaust so important to you? Well, I think it's important to everyone in some strange way. And W.G. Sebald, the German-English writer, said that no serious person ever thinks about anything else, um, which is a slight exaggeration. But um, there is a certain sense in which the Holocaust, uh, as a subject, defines you and judges you. And you find out a bit more about yourself in your response to it. You said before that you can't write about the Holocaust without suffering. You can't just type it away on the, on the keyboard. Why do you have to feel it? The writer's life is half ambition and half anxiety. And uh, there has to be both. It's no good writing a novel feeling fine, and it's no good writing a whole novel feeling miserable. It has to be both. It has to be that mixture of anxiety and ambition. Um, and uh, you get that with every novel. But more so when you write about these um, epics of human suffering. And I felt that just as much when I was writing, I wrote a novel about the, the gulag. Every writer knows what that is. It's, the process goes, you have to think, this novel is, I'm writing is, is no good. Then you have to think, um, all my novels are no good. And then when you've reached that point, you can begin. You also wrote a lot about violence and the British underclass in Lionel Asbo, for example. And at the Woolwich Barracks, we've seen a British man, a Muslim, killing another British man, a soldier, in broad daylight in central London. The London you've written about so much. How do you think you could produce this? Well, it, it's, um, it has many, many traceable threads. And what we're probably going to have for a while is what they call anomic terrorism, terrorism of alienation, ter anomie terrorism, where, where a deep misery, which, which might well have to do with feeling separated from your roots, and might well have to do with your feelings about your, your brothers and sisters in foreign countries who have suffered at the hands of the West. But you're, basically it's, it's a, an alienation and depression on your part, and you want to do something spectacular about it. Joseph Conrad, in a novel of 1908, which is incredibly prescient, um, it's about terrorists, anarchists in London. He said the two elements are um, vanity and laziness. So you want to make, because you're conceited and vain, you want to make a huge impression on the world. You want to be remembered. Um, but because you're lazy, the only way you can do it is in this explosive way. Um, and it's a very deep urge in human beings to be immortal, to send, you know, to make your name live. It's why we have children up to a point, is to, is to continue to go beyond death. Do you think you'll go beyond death with your books? If everyone wants immortality, then writers want it more than most, I think. It's true, because in fact, only time judges the quality of art. Nothing else does. The rest, criticism and so on, is just rhetoric. How much time do you think time needs to judge the a, a century. A century? Yeah. That much? If, if you're still around in a century, then that's a, a great tribute. And that's why when I see young readers of my books, 
I look at them with a special uh, interest because I know that when I die, it'll go on at least for another 30 or 40 years. You, well, you don't want to disappear completely, and having young readers guarantees that, at least for a while. That's interesting. One last question about Europe. You left Europe to go to America for family reason. We know that you haven't turned your back on Europe, yeah. but don't you feel that, in a way, you left a sinking ship? Look at the crisis in Europe. How does it look from the other side of the ocean? It, it, it all seemed, it seemed very good timing, very good time to leave and the weather is collapsing and um, various sorts of social um, turbulence. Um, it does, um, I think Europe is resilient enough and has an enormous history of, you know, five centuries of, of being the center of the world and the, and and producing the ideas that shape the world. Um, it may be that, that uh, it is in decline like all the individual countries within it, it in geo-historical decline. Does this theme of the crisis, of the economic crisis, of the interest you for, for, for novels, or maybe we can read this in your next novel as a kind of, the Holocaust novel is a parody of what's happening now? Or, or maybe the novel after. No, but after you think. It takes three or four years before the present day sinks in to you as a novelist. It has to not just be accepted in the mind, but travel down your spine and fill your body. And um, you can't respond immediately to immediate events. Um, there is this incubation period. Uh, so maybe in. So you're incubating it now? Yeah, maybe, yeah, beginning to incubate it, yes. Okay, we are looking forward to your new novel. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.